Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. This week on the podcast, we're featuring a series of conversations from the AWS reInvent conference in Las Vegas. I had a great time at this event, getting caught up on the new machine learning and AI products and services announced by AWS and its partners. If you missed the news coming out of reInvent and want to know more about what one of the biggest AI platform providers is up to, make sure you check out Monday's show, Twimble Talk number 83, a roundtable discussion I held with Dave McCrory and Lawrence Chung. We cover all of AWS's most important news, including the new SageMaker, DeepLens, Recognition Video, Transcription, Alexa for Business, Greengrass ML Inference, and more. This week, We're also running a special listener appreciation contest to celebrate hitting 1 million listens here on the podcast and to thank you all for being so awesome. Tweet to us using the hashtag Twimmel1Mil to enter. Every entry gets a fly Twimmel1Mil sticker plus a chance to win a limited run t-shirt commemorating the occasion. We'll be digging into the Magic Twimmel swag bag and giving away some other mystery prizes as well so you definitely don't want to miss this. If you're not on Twitter, or you want more ways to enter, visit twimmelaicom slash twimmel1mil for the full rundown. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank our good friends over at Intel Nirvana for their sponsorship of this podcast and our reInvent series. One of the big announcements at reInvent this year was the release of Amazon Deep Lens, a fully programmable, deep learning-enabled wireless video camera designed to help developers learn and experiment with AI both in the cloud and at the edge. DeepLens is powered by an Intel Atom X5 processor, which delivers up to 100 gigaflops of processing power to onboard applications. To learn more about DeepLens and the other interesting things Intel's been up to in the AI space, check out intelnirvana.com. Okay. This time around, we're joined by Kristen Grauman, professor in the Department of Computer Science at UT Austin. Kristen specializes in computer vision and joined me leading up to her talk on learning where to look in video at reInvent's Deep Learning Summit. Kristen and I dig into the details of her research and talk, including how an embodied video system can internalize the link between how I move and what I see so as to learn how and where to move in its environment. We discuss various policies for learning to look around actively and how an agent can learn to focus attention on the interesting elements of a scene. This was a really interesting conversation, and I'm sure you'll learn a ton from it. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am at AWS reInvent, and I've got the pleasure of being seated here with Kristen Grauman. Kristen is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at UT Austin. Kristen, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you are speaking here today at the Deep Learning Summit that's part of reInvent, and I'm really interested in learning a little bit more about your talk and what you'll be sharing. But before we do that, why don't we start by having you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got interested in machine learning? Sure. Well, and I'll work backwards right now. As you said, I'm at UT Austin, where I'm a faculty member. I've been there for 11 years now, and my specialty is in computer vision and machine learning. So that's the part of artificial intelligence where you want to make algorithms that can understand images and video. So before coming to UT Austin about 11 years ago, I did my PhD at MIT. And prior to that, I was at Boston College and for my undergrad So I got into AI happily as an undergrad. I actually had the chance to take courses that were relevant, including a course in computer vision. And from that, got the chance to to work with a professor doing some small research project that really got me excited and got me, you know, the chance to to get into the research world and then head to grad school where I explored some more. Did you do computer vision at MIT? Yes. Yeah. And as part of CSAIL or another lab there? Yeah, I was in CSAIL. Okay. And in fact, 
I'm old enough that it was the AI lab <laughs> before it became C cell, but during my time there, it, yeah, we transitioned from a separate AI lab to C cell. Okay. And what did you, what was your research focus there? So my PhD work was focused on object recognition. Okay. And in particular, we were developing ways to work with what are called local feature representations. So okay. being able to match objects based on local parts that are repeatable. And the key to my thesis in a nutshell was to show how to perform discriminative learning with these sets of local features. So we developed something called the pyramid match kernel that was very effective for fast matching of sets of features to do recognition. Can you give an example of local feature recognition and where that comes into play? Sure. Yeah. So prior to kind of the major advances with CNNs, convolutional neural networks, one representation of choice was to use interest operators to find local points and images that are going to be repeatably detectable across scale changes, lighting changes, viewpoint changes, and then describe the content around each of these local points with some invariant or, or tolerant representation that's tolerant to changes. Is this different from like an edge detector or something like that? Well, so an edge detector also can be a pointwise operator. So what's what's really what's really powerful about these local representations was the repeatability under different viewing conditions. So so once we could find points that would be the same points even if you scaled the image by two or even if you rotated the camera by 20 degrees mm -hmm. or if you changed the lighting in the room. So with those kind of features being repeatably detected, you have nice invariants so that you're really robust to changes you experience in the real world when you see the thing again. Mm -hmm. And that kind of representation got going and these features got going originally from multi-view geometry work okay. where you need to be able to match and do triangulation and reconstruct a 3D scene. But around that time, we're talking back when I was doing my PhD, this was then found to be quite important in a similar way for recognition because you want to find the object again even when it's had these changes. Okay. So the learning challenge came up when if you want to jump up to categorization, not just finding that same object again, but find, you know, not bus, this bus, but any bus or not right. this car, any car, then you need to do some kind of learning on top of that sort of representation. As a way to generalize what you've learned from the points to the, the class of object that you're trying to be able to recognize? Right, right. Okay. It's interesting. So the you describe an element of that that is is kind of invariant to, you know, positional changes and things like that. And I guess I'm thinking of this experience I had yesterday with so AWS announced this developer toolkit called Deep Lens. It's basically a camera on a basically a small computer that is self-contained and you can do you can kind of train models in the cloud and push them out to this little computer and do inference at the edge. And they did a workshop where you're detecting a hot dog, basically hot mm -hmm. dog, not hot dog, Silicon Valley reference. And one of the things that was, you know, one of the things that was real clear is that it was very intolerant to, you know, positional changes in the hot dog. You know, basically the hot dog had to fill the whole frame in order for it to be able to recognize it. You know, are, are there elements of the, the approach that you were describing that you worked on in grad school that would, you know, you know, and granted that was a, a that was a squeeze net model, so it was like a limited, you know, it's a very limited model that was designed to fit on this embedded device. But, you know, are there elements of that kind of work that you you know that are being tied to what folks are doing today with CNNs to try mm. to make them more kind of invariant to those kinds of, you know, positional shifts? Yeah. So I mean a couple of things. One, my PhD work was back in two thousand six. So we're talking yeah. about things that are not what I'm working on now, and but those local features, in fact, have that kind of invariance more strongly than your vanilla CNN representation will for the whole image. Mm -hmm. So if you want to just treat object recognition as an image classification problem, mm -hmm. that's really a simplification, right? Because when you want to recognize an object, it's not necessarily, as you said, just framed right in the view such that it occupies most of the pixels. Mm -hmm. If it is, image classification, super powerful, including with, right. you know, a, even a, a squeezed CNN. But if you want to recognize an object that's, first of all, sitting in a room full of clutter, right. then you also have to tackle what's called the detection problem, which means you know, localizing and finding where boundaries of objects are, or you know, at the very least scanning around to make classification decisions. Right? Uh -huh. Furthermore, the kind of work we do now, you know, we're actually interested in this very question. You know, if I have an agent 
that's visually intelligent, you know, it's not enough for it to be handed flashcards and asked to name them. Right. I mean, it's a stepping stone and it's a huge <laughs> one that, you know, has grown so much in the last four or five years. Yeah. But they also need to be able to figure out which pictures should this agent be taking? Mm-hmm. You know, where does it have to look? What is an object, even if that's an object I haven't seen before, I being the agent, you know, haven't seen before mm-hmm. during training. So, so yeah, I think you can, the kind of demo you described is super powerful, but you know, not all problems are, you know, we have to go even further than image classification on a web mm. photo or a photo that's kind of closely mm-hmm. zoomed in. And that's actually a great transition to the topic of your discussion later on today, right? You're talking about, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're talking about today? Sure. Yeah. So my plan today is to give an overview of one segment of my group's work. And what I'm going to focus on is the theme of learning where to look in video. Mm -hmm. So again, when we think about training up today's state-of-the-art object recognition systems, such as those that take deep convolutional neural networks, train them on a data set like ImageNet, for which you have a million images, say, with a thousand different categories you can name. Well, benchmarks like that and training sources like that treat the problem only in part. And this is because they bake in intelligence about how those photos even came to exist, Mm -hmm. right? So these are human-taken photos. Right. And their photos, furthermore, that, you know, they have the good composition a human photographer would make. Furthermore, they were chosen to be, you know, uploaded on the web to even be good enough as an exemplar, you know, that right. someone wants to see. And so if you contrast that with what you get if you strap a camera to a person's head or if you strap a camera to a robot's head or mm-hmm. a vehicle, all such kind of egocent- what are called egocentric or first-person perspective views coupled with video, meaning ongoing observation, not just a well-chosen moment in time, but, you know, just continuous video, then you'll see that the image content and quality is quite different. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to rely on that baked-in intelligence about human-taken photos, then part of your job in the system is to decide where to look in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so my talk today, that's kind of the motivating disparity, right, from going from labeling photos that humans took to having a dynamic camera in the world that captures video on an ongoing way and has intelligence about which parts of it matter or which parts are recognition worthy. Mm -hmm. So that's my theme. And then I'm going to talk about that on a few fronts. One is to look at how to have systems that learn in an embodied manner. Mm -hmm. So if you think about snapshots on the web as disembodied, right? Right. Because they're just these moments in time, you know, that humans took. Well, then if you have embodied learning observations, you might be able to do something more. And so you take this as a loose inspiration, you know, we certainly know biological systems build up their visual representations, not from flashcard learning, mm-hmm. like the web photos you could take to be, but instead from interacting, moving in the world and having the context of that motion and interaction as part of the learning process. Mm. So, you know, think of a baby doing this, for example, right. and there's, you know, there's enough evidence on the cognitive science side that that's actually crucial, you know, like I'll point to a study with kittens famous one back from the 60s, where if you deprive a kitten of the ability to control its own motion, it has severe detriments to visual perception development, even if it sees the same things that a kitten who can control its own motion hmm. sees. Interesting. So so that's kind of the first thing you look at that as motivation. We've been studying how to perform visual learning in an embodied context. And one of our steps in that direction is to take first-person egocentric video So video, in our case, this one's captured on a vehicle where we don't just see the pixels in the video. We also can pay attention to what we call motor signals. So physical measurements about how the agent is moving Mm -hmm. in sync with the video that we observe. So now we're talking about kind of direction orientation of a vehicle in addition to the video that it's capturing. That's right. Yeah. So we look at the GPS coordinates and the heading of the vehicle and sensed from, you know, outside of the visual sensors. And now we look at them synchronized with the video stream. Mm -hmm. And then the idea is that this video stream, let it be unlabeled, which means, you know, no human has sat down and done some annotation on it. It's just video that's been captured. But the goal was to let the system discover the structure linking the two Mm -hmm. so that it's, it's building its own visual representation that's informed by this embodiment. So more specifically, we posed it in terms of ego motion conditioned new view predictions. So 
Ego but, motion condition, <laughs> new view prediction. Yeah, so there's okay. a lot of words at once. What it, what we're saying is that, okay, suppose you are seeing something, you, the agent, of course, at a current moment in time. Mm-hmm. Now, can we have a representation where it's predictable for that agent how things will look if it moves in a certain way? Mm. Okay. So you can teach that from unlabeled video, right? If it knows, senses its motion, sees what it sees, it's going to learn that connection between how I move and what I see Mm -hmm. as a function of my motion. So so if I can just take a step to kind of paraphrase here, you know, we've seen there's a, you know, there's work that's been done on, you know, just taking still video from a single perspective and trying to predict future frames based on what the, the learning system has seen so far. Mm -hmm. And what you're doing is you're taking that a step further by coupling, you know, first of all, the, the learning system isn't static. It's, you know, it's in motion and it's field of view shifts. And so you're trying to incorporate that signal into its ability to predict what it's seeing next uh, as well. Yeah. You can definitely think of it that way. And furthermore, so both the dynamic camera and the embodiment or kind of physical motor signal being part of the learning process are mm-hmm. distinct. And thirdly, the desire to have this be part of representation learning for better recognition. So once this learning mm. happens, the idea is this will give us, you know, we'll learn this embedding that is capable to do view prediction as a function of ego motion. Mm-hmm. And now you give us maybe a video, but also even a static photo. And that can be embedded in this space where those benefits of visual perception that that you arrive at by paying attention to ego motion are there so mm-hmm. that even the static frame static image representation is stronger mm-hmm. and so we'll we'll tackle classic recognition tasks and bump them up because of this kind of so-called pre-training from unlabeled video mm-hmm. you're talking about embeddings here and representations and i usually hear that in the context of you know word embeddings and things like that and and less so in the context of video is that common or is that fairly common in the video world as well? Right. And so the word embedding here, I just mean as a learned feature space. So you come in with your X, which is your image or your video frame or your video Mm -hmm. sequence. And then there's some F of X you want to apply. And the F will be the thing you learn, which will embed Mm. X into a space that is more appropriate for what you're trying to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of the challenge that you're going after. Like, where are you in terms of that research? Yeah. So in this part of the work, we had some some nice results come out. So we trained this idea with video captured from a vehicle. There's a data set called Kitty that's widely used for autonomous driving kind of work. So we take that video, no labels, learn representation from it, and then tackle a number of recognition challenges. I'll take one. So we take a scene categorization task where your job is to name the category among five, about 400 categories that a new image belongs to? Is it a cathedral? Is it a plaza? Is it a courtyard? Is it a hotel room, etc.? Mm-hmm. And what we found, just kind of in a nutshell, is that with this unsupervised pre-training from unlabeled video, mm-hmm. the system will have a 30% increase in accuracy compared to what it'll get if it's just training in the traditional way, which means those disembodied photos for, mm-hmm. that are labeled. So, this is particularly evident when you are low on training data. Mm-hmm. So if you don't have a million exemplars for cathedrals, say, but you have a handful mm-hmm. or some other or other any other class that lists sits in the long tail of yeah. objects, then this is especially important to have this kind of pre-learning from just moving around the world and looking at things. So where does the labeling come in? Where did that? Yeah. Okay, right. So we can learn this representation purely in an unsupervised way and now do any classification we like, you know, train a CNN, train a nearest neighbor classifier, train a support vector machine, any, you know, depending on the capacity of the model required and the amount of labeled data you have, you know, go from this pre-trained representation to tackle it there. Or, and we've also, we've explored two ways, or you could treat our video learning as a regularizer for the classification task and do it jointly. And so your question, where does labeled data come in? If we have, when we have task specific data that is labeled, Mm -hmm. then Either we'll use it, you know, in this modular way, pre-train and now train for the supervised task or jointly where the video is kind of a supplement to the labeled instances you're using to train for the target task. Okay. So let's look at each of those in in series. In the first case, you're pre-training on the video data, coming up with your embeddings and features and things like that. How does that feed into the training of the next model? So in that, that first case, it's very modular in that 
now just imagine instead of starting x equals pixel vector, mm -hmm. you start with x equals our embedding. Feature vector? Yeah. Okay. So you're Got in it. a vector space. And so that's just like Got it. off the shelf. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that would have the advantages of being modular, you know, the recognition tasks you wish to tackle with this feature space can mm -hmm. be, it can arise in the future, right? And the data doesn't have to be sitting right. together. Okay. Whereas if you treat it the second way, this assumes you've got the task data for your task of interest in hand at that very same moment as you learn mm -hmm. from the video. And so you jointly train them. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so you've got some results that show performance improvements relative to relative to what specifically? What yeah. model did you right. base, baseline against? So always apples to apples. So whatever recognition model classifier would be used for that scene recognition task and whichever label data it would receive, we take the exact same for our method. So for example, if it's a CNN, which we've tested, then the same you know, we're talking about the same CNN architecture, mm -hmm. plus or minus this learning from unlabeled video. Mm, okay. Uh, same amount of labels for both. So that's the important baseline to say, if I just did everything the same way, but now I also have this benefit of watching video and knowing how I moved, then how much better does that make things? Okay. Oh, interesting. So what else are you covering in your talk today? Yeah. So this is the first thing I'll look at. And then from there, we transition because what I just described was learning from how an agent moves before a recognition task. And then we think, okay, not only do we have to, well, not only would we like to benefit from this ego motion embodiment being in the world when learning, but also when acting or testing. Mm -hmm. So we've been looking at active recognition. Active recognition is a problem where you are not passively given the data to recognize you, and I keep saying you, and I am always talking about the system, right? Uh -huh. The system is given an environment and it has to make choices about what observations to even collect mm -hmm. to succeed in the task. So active recognition systems would want to be able to know where to look around in the scene in sequence mm -hmm. to decide what the scene is or to let, to recognize an object. Or equivalently, a robot with active recognition would be able to hold an object and turn it in a sequence of ways such that it rapidly deduces what this object is. So either manipulating your the embodiment or manipulating the objects itself to essentially get better information about what it's seeing. Exactly. And how do you go about doing all that? Yeah, <laughs> right. And so it actually flows well from the ego motion-based learning. Now, you can imagine that if an agent's going to be smart about choosing its motions, one way to get smart about that is for it to be able to predict how things might look if it moved a certain way. Because mm -hmm. if you can look forward in time or motion that way, then you can predict which motions you could make that would most reduce ambiguity. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a current set of posteriors over all the objects I know or all the scenes I know. And then I can envision how things are going to perhaps change if I move in ways one through N. And it doesn't have to be discrete, of course. But then which of those N would most, you know, reduce the entropy of those posteriors, right? To mm -hmm. say, okay, things are starting to converge more. I think this object is getting more clear. So that ability to look ahead is related to what I was describing for the ego motion condition view prediction, mm -hmm. but you're not done with that. So what we explored for first to tackle this is so-called end-to-end approach where we would jointly train modules to do all the important steps of active recognition. So what are they? There's three. One is perception. So a way to take the raw sensor input and map it into some internal representation that's useful for the task, you know, mm -hmm. key to representation learning. Two is action selection. So some component that makes that intelligent choice about which motion to make or which manipulation to issue. Right. And then three, evidence fusion, which says, okay, this is happening in a loop. And so right. as these observations come in, how do I aggregate everything I've seen to inform the next round of action selection or, you know, if I'm stopping to give my final estimate. Okay. So it sounds to me like, is it fair to say that in a way we're trying to build curiosity in the model? Like the way I, I'm, I'm thinking about it and correct me if I'm, if I'm off here and I'm simplifying, but you know, the robot is looking at a scene. It's just determining a set of probabilities of, you know, what future scenes might look like if it oriented itself in different ways. And one strategy would be for it to, you know, to orient it 
itself in a way that has the the lowest probability like it where it's the most unclear about what's going to happen so as to learn the environment which strikes me as like a curiosity type of yeah. motivation yeah this is a great point you're making in fact it leads to two things so one is that's exactly the right intuition and in the case of recognition it's curious for a goal right so it's this mm -hmm. is the case where there is some task it and the agent knows it's tr learning right. to do well and in fact we're going to be learning this in this in a reinforcement learning manner. I was just going to ask about that. <laughs> yeah. And so the next, you can, the system could learn in two ways. It could learn it in a, in a greedy myopic way, which says, I always want the next, what's called the next best view, mm -hmm. you know, which would be roughly, you know, let's pick the one that most, you know, increases information gain. Mm -hmm. But you can also train these reinforcement learning systems for some budget of time mm -hmm. that says, well, I'm, you know, I don't need to always make just one next best. I'd like to think about a sequence of motions that will get me to my resolution. So, you know, because in every step, maybe the agent can't teleport, right. you know, out of this building to another one, but it can make a sequence of motions that in aggregate it expects to have good influence. So that's kind of analogous to tuning your explore exploit or how short term yeah. the agent is. Right. So, right. How short term it is, is definitely related. And so it's saying if you have a time horizon for decision making, mm -hmm. then you can train this big network consisting of all these modules I mentioned and perception and evidence fusion, action selection mm -hmm. could be trained to target that budget. This mm -hmm. is all controlled by how you specify that reward function. Right. And you could also target it to be more instantaneous, just always greedily making the next best move. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you don't have, or it doesn't make sense to have a budget to target. Mm -hmm. So we kind of explore both of those and, but when you mention curiosity, it, it really rings a bell for me too, because where we've gone since then looking at this is to suppose, well, what if we have an agent that has to be smart of how to look around, mm -hmm. not just for this task that I've pre-ordained, right? right? Not just for image net classification or whatever it is, but just for a system I'm going to deploy and needs to be intelligent about looking around before that task gets defined. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of in an absolute sense. And this is what starts to sound like curiosity, right? Yeah. Because it needs to be able to jump into a new environment, look around, and have those look around motions be smart, but not purely motivated by a closed world of decisions that it's going to make. Right. Does that make sense? Right. You know, I think about that at, you know, at the far end of simplicity, like just looking around this room, objects on a table are going to be more interesting than a wall, for example. And so, you know, I think that some of the same things that we traditionally use for object detection, like features and edges and color variation and things like that might percolate up as signals for this kind of model. Is that right? Yeah. So you, right. So what will a system learn if it's asked to be able to look around intelligently without a recognition goal? Right. And so our expectation is it will learn to look at the places that are least predictable from everything else around. So your example of an object on the table and the wall, well, once the system has seen a part of the wall, a lot of walls are smooth. And so there's little need to evaluate many other glimpses on that wall because with high probability, they're going to be similar. Mm -hmm. And you can learn that. And whereas once an agent glimpses a part of a scene that's interesting, which can be more textured, which also means harder to infer missing pixels of, mm -hmm. then it'll start concentrating some observations there until it, it becomes clear what you know, by drawing on regularities learned before for other scenes, mm -hmm. you know, that would help you reconstruct those. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it strikes me that one of the the differences between kind of the human visual system and the, you know, cameras is that, you know, we've got a uh, focal area and then peripheral. And so it seems like it's more important for us to, you know, move our heads around and, and kind of focus on different things where as you know, a robot can just like do a 360 degree scan and capture the pixels of everything. Like, why do we even need this learning based curiosity given the differences between cameras yeah. and vision? Yeah, it's a really good point. So that's right. Sensing can almost in some dimensions is more complete for a robot. You know, like you said, a 360 mm -hmm. capture. And in fact, that's the kind of data we work with right now. But don't forget that the robot also needs to move in the world, right? So even if I have omnidirectional observations at a mm -hmm. place in space, what I need to know can be around the corner. And mm -hmm. so you think about, you know, if it's not just narrow field of view glimpses, even if you don't are rec restricted that way, you still have a need to move in the scene. Mm -hmm. Or similarly, think about that case of an agent robot holding an object in which its own manipulator is occluding part of it or, you know, part of the object is behind. So mm -hmm. 
even with omnidirectional view, there's content that's invisible. It's behind the object. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And was there another example or scenario that you walked through that you're planning to walk through in your talk? Oh, yeah. So we've talked about kind of ego motion informing how the agent learns a representation. And then we kind of bring that up into active recognition by learning policies for how to intelligently move around mm -hmm. to make recognition decisions or just explore in a curious way. So the last thing that I look at is instead of kind of how to look around as a agent centered question, I think about it actually as a human centered question. So mm -hmm. we were working with 360 video, okay. which quite exciting media domain, immersive video and right. connecting to VR and the way you right now watch a 360 video as a human viewer is a little bit of trial and error, right? Because you can't see what's behind you. Right. And so whether you wear a headset, whether you sit at a computer and mouse around on an interface like on YouTube to view the 360 content, you are in charge of deciding where to look, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit of trial and error in the sense that you may have to watch a video a couple of times to really know where the interesting things are. Mm -hmm. And so while 360 video is so appealing, even as a consumer for, you know, just capturing everything so I don't have to make those decisions at capture right. time, well, you're still left with this decision making at viewer time, right. right? So we looked at this with the where to look question in mind. Mm. And what we've been developing is a way for learning how to direct, well, think of it as automatic video cinematography. So mm -hmm. can we learn how to direct a narrow field of view virtual camera within that 360 sphere? So both in terms of its viewpoint angle, mm. as well as the zoom. Okay. So that you could map a 360 video into a normal field of view video that's 2D and flat and planar. And interesting. Yeah. And got the stuff, right? So, right. and this is, you know, right away that sounds. And there's a temporal aspect of this as well because you're not or i'm assuming you're trying to smoothly pan around this yeah. 360 view as opposed to flash you That's know right. some sequence of interesting yeah, things right, in it right. yeah so it has to be carving out a video path that right. has some kind of motion model as well okay not just so your question almost alludes to the two parts of the approach and one is to figure out where are the pieces on the sphere that look capture worthy and then, and then how do I plan, how to get, optimize yeah, a path okay. to hit them as well as possible? And now I'm immediately kind of brought to two thoughts on how you would go about this. One is kind of the extension of all the stuff we, that we spoke about earlier where you're learning, you know, features of interest based on, based on the kind of the observations themselves and trying to identify, you know, the stuff we talked about previously. Another would be, you know, like imitation learning, put the human in the headset, have a bunch of people look around and yeah. kind of trying to learn a model based on what they find interesting. Mm -hmm. Are you looking at both of those or? Yeah, we're actually pursuing something distinct, but the kind of the, the imitation learning would make a lot of sense. And it's something to consider, right? And you can just treat it as a supervised problem where if I've seen where humans tend to look or even, even better, if I get to see video editors edit, mm -hmm. then I've got, you know, good data to train with. Problem is that's, as you can imagine, that's going to be hard to build up enough data for potentially, right? So it's expensive mm -hmm. on the annotation side. So our insight was that this actually can be learned from unlabeled video. Mm -hmm. And that's because people take a lot of video. That's not 360. That is normal field of view. Right. And of course, we know it's on the online. And furthermore, people kind of have selected video that's worth uploading. So what we do is have the agent, the, the learning algorithm, look at hundreds of hours of unlabeled video on YouTube of mm -hmm. varying content, right? So we'd like this to be content independent to build up a model of what human taken video looks like. Okay. And now you get your 360 content and imagine chopping it up into all these glimpses throughout the viewing sphere. And over time, so these are space time chunks, then just trying to score these by saying how, how much like this manifold of human taken video are each of these glimpses like? Now, it, just to interrupt, is there a lot of 360 video on YouTube? Yeah. Really? I had no <laughs> idea. <laughs> I know. Well, I didn't, I, you know, and I wasn't aware either until we started this project maybe okay. two, one and a half, two years ago. There is. And, you know, we've looked, started to look at some of the stats. I mean, we're, we're on the research side, of course, but I, we found stats like, you know, the 360 camera sales are expected to go by 100% every year for the next six years. I hope I got that right. You know, so there's huge growth both in okay. the, the sale and the use of the cameras plus the content is online. And yeah, you can download these 360 videos in 4K from Google, right? And right. that's what we do to get our data sets. 
So that's how you acquire the data sets. But run by me again what the insight is to. Yeah. So the insight the, is. The points of interest there? Yeah. Rather than have kind of an intensive, annotated version of training our system right. where humans teach it where to look explicitly, we'll let it be implicit and free of label because if I have massive collection of unlabeled video, mm -hmm. these are all videos that humans took from normal field of view cameras, mm -hmm. then the notion is when you give me a glimpse, and here a glimpse means some narrow field of view carve out from mm -hmm. a 360 video, say, let it be five seconds long, say. Now, if you take out that glimpse and now do some computation to say, how close is it to this manifold of human taken content? Like based on some, in our case, 3D convolutional features of that glimpse, is it close to that space or is it really far? If it's close, that means it shares some visual properties. Indeed, in our case, what closeness will mean will be things like framing effects. So mm -hmm. if I understand what you're saying, you've got 3D video, but you've also got regular 2D video and you're mapping scenes from the 3D or you're trying to map qualities of the scenes from the 3D to video to the 2D video to identify what looks like a human taken video. Yeah, Is that right? Exactly. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. Okay. So that's where that's where the the kind of capture worthy measure comes from, okay. and it comes from unannotated data, and it really does pick up on things like framing, composition. Mm -hmm. So if you have a three hundred and sixty camera just bouncing around the world, I mean, suppose you know not unintelligently driven, then right. a lot of the views are not well framed, but you know there's some portion of it that is, and okay. so that's that's one thing that'll be learned, kind of the composition, the framing effects. You can potentially also learn content, right? So mm -hmm. the kind of things that are worth filming versus, you know, the blank wall? No. The mm -hmm. the scene with the people? Probably. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, wow. Really interesting. Now, you mentioned that this, these three things that you talked about are just kind of one of a bunch of things that you work mm -hmm. on in your lab. Can you give us an overview of sure. some of the other areas of interest? Yeah. So the other areas that we work on today, one is looking at fashion. So we've been looking at, for a long time, we've been looking at semantic representations built on what are called attributes. Mm -hmm. So these properties like fuzzy, flat, red, metallic, okay. et cetera. And so this is kind of a way to connect visual properties with language. So we've been working on attributes for, for many years, uh, including developing interactive image search techniques that exploit them. Like I want to mm -hmm. find the image that's like this or the, the image of a shoe, say that's like this, but pointier, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And more recently, we've been looking at fashion in the attribute space, but now at full body images of people and understanding mm -hmm. things like style and trend forecasting and compatibility between items. Okay. So this is one project looking at fashion and vision. Okay. We touched on kind of two parts of my work, really. One is embodied visual perception, mm -hmm. which is kind of on this border of vision and robotics to do recognition in the world. Right. And we touched on 360 video analysis, which okay. we're working in. The other elements of my group right now, we have some work looking at image and video segmentation. Okay. It's kind of very core vision type stuff of finding objects in video and images. And finally, how to do things quickly. So specifically recognition. So we're looking at how to have a system that can make only observations it needs in the sense of timely recognition. So if I have a very deep network, for example, mm -hmm but I can't afford to run the whole thing. Can I dynamically choose which portions of it to run for a given new image? Or if I have a video mm -hmm. where, you know, we talked about how to do this in an embodied way, but even if I'm disembodied and I'm just a machine sitting there processing video, you know, what parts of the video need attention and what mm -hmm. features should I extract on each part? And so what specifically are we, are in the, let's take the simplest case of an image, what specifically are you doing there? Yeah, so... What we've been doing most recently, and this is a collaboration with my colleagues at IBM, we've been looking at, if you have, do you know ResNet? So this is one mm -hmm. architecture that's quite successful, has these skip connections between layers and blocks. So we have an approach that will use reinforcement learning to come up with a policy that is input conditioned to decide how to route through that network mm -hmm. dynamically so that, you know, ideally maybe you'd like to run every single one, mm -hmm. but with time pressure you will then decide which to keep and which to drop. Mm -hmm. And so that means, let's see, I mean, for a fraction of the block computation, we'll nearly meet the, even actually match the accuracy of the full network running everywhere oh, wow. yet. Oh, that's really cool. 
Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out to chat with me this morning. Any final words or ways for, you know, places to point folks, ways for folks to get in touch with you? Oh, sure. Well, thanks, of course, for having me. It's great to have this discussion. People who are interested in this work can check out our website from my homepage. And we share the papers, but also the code and data surrounding all the things we're doing. So we'd be happy to see anyone being able to use them or build on them. Oh, great. We'll definitely link to that in the show notes so folks will be able to find it easily from there. All right. Well, Kristen, thanks so much. I really appreciated having you on the show. Okay. Thank you. Nice talking with you. All right, everyone. That's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. For more information on Kristen or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 85. To follow along with the AWS reInvent series, visit twimlai.com slash reInvent. To enter our Twimmel 1 mil contest, visit twimlai.com slash twimmel 1 mil. Of course, we'd be delighted to hear from you either via a comment on the show notes page or via Twitter to at twimlai or at Sam Charrington. Thanks again to Intel Nirvana for their sponsorship of this series. To learn more about their role in Deep Lens and the other things they've been up to, visit intelnirvana.com. And of course, thanks once again to you for listening and catch you next time.